It's Sail Chandra's Saturday Night Special. Tonight's guest, Brad Lolliger. Hi there, and welcome to my Saturday Night Special. Tonight I'll be talking with staff attorney for the Center for Elder Law and Justice, Brad Lolliger. We discuss the legal system as it relates to senior citizens, the social ramifications of the coronavirus, and community theater. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel. For updates on when new episodes debut, click the bell icon for notifications. Thanks. Brad Lolliger, I am Lolliger actually. <laughs> I'm so glad that you could be with me today. Um, you're a staff attorney for the Center for Elder Law and Justice, and maybe you can tell the listeners what that is all about. Absolutely, Sal, and thanks so much for having me on the uh, program. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so Center for Elder Law and Justice, we are a civil legal services agency. We're a not-for-profit organization. We started out back in 1978, and back then we were known as the Legal Services for the Elderly Project. Over years, that morphed into Legal Services for the Elderly Dis- disabled, or disadvantaged of Western New York. About three or four years ago, we rebranded and we became the Center for Elder Law and Justice. And my nutshell summary of what we do is we provide free legal services to folks, mostly people 60 and older, but not a hard and fast rule. We use the law to keep people in their homes to make sure that they have the benefits that they need and they're entitled to. And we really branch out into all different areas of um, practice. And all of our services are free, which is the, obviously the most exciting thing. There's such a huge need and we're, we're glad to be there to support, to support older adults. It sounds like a great resource. And I know that you had mentioned that you try and keep people in their homes. Do you, do you find that bankruptcy or loss of faculties, you know, in order to control your own decision making, is that mostly what you seem? So our office, we do a whole bunch of of different legal services. One thing we've always done over the years is like healthcare issues, Medicare and Medicaid. Even though we have a system of Medicare, which is great, it doesn't cover every single thing. So sometimes people have to fight to um, uh, get certain benefits covered and we will actually um, fight for those benefits. What's an example of uh, a benefit somebody might need to fight for? Let's say you're in, uh, an older adult ends up in a hospital and they get home and they then get a bill from the hospital saying, hey, you owe us so many thousands of dollars. Medicare might say, oh, we're not covering that because you weren't deemed inpatient. And if that happens, you could be liable for that that bill possibly. Because Medicare is a federal benefit, we're able to go to an administrative fair hearing. You have a, a, a right to certain hearings. And so we can go and fight for you before an administrative law judge. There's a he- something called a fair hearing where you actually make your arguments and say, no, I really was inpatient. This is what the medical records show. This is why I shouldn't have to pay this bill. So what's really interesting about it is that, you know, you don't often think, okay, I needed a, a paralegal or an attorney to help me in this because you're not filing a lawsuit. You're not suing somebody. You're, you're not even setting foot really in a, in a courtroom or going downtown. A lot of this is done via phone at the federal level, but it's still something where an attorney can help you. Your other question too that I that I wanted to loop back to was about older adults, bankruptcy. What we see all the time is folks on fixed incomes. Sure. There's only your one emergency and the coronavirus is highlighting this. Yeah. You, you are, if somebody loses a job and then has a health emergency, everything can crumble. Every cent is so so important. And so fighting for benefits that people are entitled to, that they need to make themselves uh, remain independent in the community, keep their dignity. You know, that's what we're all about. Correct me if I'm wrong, but lawyers are traditionally bottom feeders and blood suckers. And, <laughs> and, no. I, I will correct you on that. No, no. Not traditionally, I, I, right. only occasionally. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate a good lawyer joke just like anyone, Sal. So, to be serious, look, you're not for profit that allows people to, to basically retain their dignity in face of what might be an insurmountable kind of legal challenge or, or maybe a clerical error, maybe something as innocuous as that, or maybe something as remote as just administrative 
callousness. So we do in this country specifically, we have an aging population. Do you see that your numbers of intakes, people requesting your services are going up? Yeah, I, a perfect example of that is just the growth of the agency itself. So I told you we started in 1978. I started as an intern back in the summer of 2011. Back at that time, we had... Yeah, uh, well, I know. Back in 2011, um, Marvel's Thor was <laughs> in the box office. It was a time. President Obama was still in his first term. Yeah. Uh, you know, all those sorts of things. It sure. seems like a lifetime ago, but... At that time, our agency had, I think, five full-time attorneys and maybe five or six full-time paralegals, a receptionist and an administrative assistant, and our CEO. Today, we have over 50 staffers, including probably close to 20 attorneys, just as many paralegals, and we're spread out over three offices. We have an office in downtown Buffalo. We have an office in Lockport up in Niagara County. We have an office in Dunkirk in Chautauqua County. And we serve all eight counties of Western New York. So the fact that we've grown so much shows that we're growing to meet the need and the increasing need for older adults. Um, you know, just a great issue by way of example, when you said you know, one little issue that can create problems, uh, for, for a little uh, Latin here, there's something called in rem foreclosure. You ever heard of that before? Oh, yeah. I think that was uh, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, he spoke <laughs> about that in his meditations. No, please, for the <laughs> Exactly. <best. laughs> so here's the deal. When you hear about uh, uh, foreclosure, you're usually thinking about a bank, right? Like, the bank is foreclosing on your house because you couldn't make the mortgage payments. What in rem foreclosure is, is from the city or the county for non-payment of taxes. Let's say you're an older adult and you just went through cancer and your, your drugs that you need to take now, your prescription medications, through the roof co-pays. You have, you have all these extra medical bills. You may be an older adult who's living in the city of Buffalo. You've owned that house for 40 years. You've, you've owned it, you own it outright, you paid off your mortgage, it's yours free and clear. You still have to pay your taxes every year on that. Sure. Let's, let's say you fell behind on your taxes because of that medical emergency and you had to pay for your cancer treatments. Or let's say you, know, you did have a source of income between you and your spouse and your spouse dies so you don't get their pension anymore or you're getting a way lesser amount of their pension. If that happens, uh, um, maybe you fall behind on your property taxes. The city or the county can actually foreclose on your house and say, hey, you didn't pay us um, $3,000 in taxes, so we're gonna go after your $85,000 house that you've owned for your whole adult life. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense that you're gonna make somebody homeless for $4,000 that's going to make it even harder for them. It's also going to make more expenses on the system. So to be an, an older adult and have to fight city hall is, is really tough. So our office, you know, we're attorneys. We're able to look at the case, go over a person's finances, uh, negotiate with the city or the county and say, look, let's come up with a payment plan here. Let's see if we can reduce this amount or can we do something to make sure that this person's able to stay in their own home. So. It could be as simple as they, they missed the bill or it was misplaced or you had every other emergency going on in your life right. that that this thing got overlooked. And so it, it, that's a big thing that we do every fall is when the in-rem foreclosures. And sometimes we're down there at the convention center, you know, the day of right before the auction is, is scheduled to happen, trying to save people's homes. So you bring a bit of humanity to the legal system, it seems. Now, between you and I, I know that you had mentioned that you work across eight counties. Do you find that the city of Buffalo as a municipality is particularly good or bad with regard to, to you helping them adjudicate these people traversing, let's say, foreclosures, to take your example? We've been, the, the bigger, you know, metropolitan areas, we've been able to work pretty easily with them. You know, things are different, even though we have a unified court system and even though, you know, the laws are the same throughout the state of New York, different counties are, are different. It all depends. I know that the biggest thing we have is our reputation. We've been, you know, doing this work for so long. We build these relationships and are able to really make a difference for our clients. 
Yeah. Now, one of the things I believe you offer, and correct me if I'm wrong, is legal guardianship for those who are deemed insufficient to be in charge of their own affairs. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the main area of practice that I focus on. This is people with dementia or people with severe Alzheimer's or TBIs or or anything like that. Um, Exactly. Now, let me just give a little bit of a preamble before I ask my question. You have a degree, an undergraduate degree in social work, correct? I actually have a master's degree in social work. Oh, you do? I with psychology, yeah. Oh, okay. Now, do you find that your social work background has led you to this discipline of law as opposed to, let's say, um, uh, property law or... Absolutely. To, to, to wax uh, uh, poetic here, my, you know, yesterday was Mother's Day. My mom was a nurse for hospice and I always looked up to her and the, the work that she did. And I always knew I wanted to be involved in, in a helping profession of some kind. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even know that, that working in a not-for-profit legal services organization, helping other adults was even a thing. And so... I remember going to a job fair and uh, my my boss was there actually sitting at the table seeking out interns for that uh, summer. She explained to me the guardianship work and what the office did and my interest was piqued and really it is the work I do is such a good blend of, of law and social work and trying to understand people and how to meet them where they're at. And you know, I find a lot of times folks just want to be heard. People just want to be able to tell their story and oftentimes when they're able to unburden themselves, they're, they they have that clarity then to focus on their issue and what really needs to get addressed and taken care of. So that's admirable, certainly. I think that anybody who is in a capacity to help their society or their community in some way should probably try and do so, whether that's even sweeping your own front porch or helping somebody who can't help themselves. It's important. Do you think that the, do you think that there is any sort of legislation or do you think that there is anything in terms of just the way society is situated right now that makes your job harder or easier? Do you feel like, let's say, the family unit, I know that a lot of people don't have live amongst their extended families or they live in separate states or municipalities. Why don't you just talk a little bit about, about what what would make your job easier or or harder? What just some of the realities are? I think one of the the hardest things which you were just talking about is separated families or folks who are spread out. We see a lot of older adults who just uh, oftentimes feel lonely or isolated. And of course, with everything that's going on, that's even worse now. That's a lot of times how we find um, older adults who fall victim to elder abuse scams. Um, They're victimized. You know, we've seen umpteen cases of, uh, of an unscrupulous actor who gets on the phone and says, hey, we need your information. We've even seen this happening with coronavirus, where people are sending direct messages on Twitter to folks saying, oh, well, we need your social security number so we can process your stimulus payment. Right. I mean, and if these, if these older adults don't have people who they can talk to, who they can bounce this stuff off of, if, if they don't have any connections in the community, um, that is puts them at a higher risk for, for falling prey to these sort of things. And, and there's no shame in it. We always try to remove that stigma because it happens to so, so many people and these scammers are more and more sophisticated. So well, the greater I, isolated you are. If I can just um, just interject real quickly. Of course. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think that, <laughs> I, I mean, the elderly are certainly undergoing a bit of future shock, but I myself, I feel like I undergo future shock um, just at the sheer this sheer magnitude of the changes. And I mean, I just a, a brief um, sort of anecdote. I helped um, my wife's grandmother set up her antenna, her digital antenna. This is something I was unable to do over the phone. So I had to mask myself. I had to wear gloves. I had to um, observe all the hygienic, um, I guess, uh, niceties protocol in order to do this for her and it made her life so much better because it's just it, as you said there's i there's a there's a an issue of loneliness there's a loneliness epidemic that exists irrespective of the coronavirus and shelter in place orders and i think it's exacerbated by it um so the fact that these people are falling prey to these unctuous pernicious uh scammers it really turns my stomach because for all we want, I think that we're a society that's always in this um, 
this contentious uh, warfare of one generation against the next. You know, I heard the coronavirus being called the boomer remover. Or, <laughs> it's just despicable because I think so much is manufactured and real people are um, they're getting victimized, you know, maybe because they're not they're not so caught up on everything. And those moments when we do have older adults who connect with a younger generation, I mean, the the joy, I've been a Meals on Wheels volunteer in the past, and the joy that brings Feed me. more of Western New York now. For Correct. Yeah. You're exactly right. Yeah. Uh, how, how is it situated now? Feed More Western New York has two programs, the Food Bank and uh, uh, Meals on Wheels. It's all under one umbrella now, which is Perfect. awesome. And the thing we see about these older adults is, you know, they help to contribute to the society we have now and to then be in a situation where you're, you're vulnerable. I mean, it, it's just a horrible thing to have to go through that sort of thing. And so that's why we're available to, to help folks, to point them in the right direction, to you know, get them in a situation where maybe they aren't afraid anymore. We have a whole unit of, of elder abuse prevention where we do safety planning with older adults. So let's say they've got a son or a daughter who's stealing their social security check every month they're afraid to, to confront them about it because they're the ones who are pulling the purse strings. Yeah. We can come up with uh, getting them to a safe place, getting them an order of protection, appointing somebody to be a healthcare proxy and a power of attorney who they actually trust. I mean, that that's the hardest thing is when it's a family member or a loved one. And, and you know, every person has self-determination and individual rights. And so the heartbreaking cases are is you know we get people who do come to us and they tell us our story or their story and we say hey we can do this to, to help you but they don't want to pull the trigger right. even if your son is a jerk you probably don't want to send him to jail and yeah that is, is you're, the tough thing you're offering them uh recourse and they are under a sort of what i would figure is a, an emotional duress really that mm -hmm. they're unable to to make this severance if they need to or to do it because it's it's a very hard thing to be betrayed and it's an especially hard thing to be betrayed by um, somebody who's supposed to have your best interest at heart so mm -hmm. i can imagine the nature of your work is very emotionally taxing there is it's it it's really, really tough and there is hard things. And that's why our old supervising attorney, Bill Barry, who was there for nearly 35 years um, as an attorney, you know, always said, you got to appreciate the victories and, and always celebrate those. Because when we are able to get results for clients and do things that better their lives, um, it's, it's so important because that means so much to them. Yep. Hold iron will, Bill. That's there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Brad, do you want to speak a little bit about how the coronavirus and the shelter-in-place orders have acutely affected your work for Center for Elder Law and Justice? Yeah, absolutely. So we talked a little bit about the benefits that folks need, Medicare, Medicaid, um, Social Security. All of those wheels have really sort of ground down to uh, a very, very slow pace now because of this. The Social Security Office, people can't physically go to it right now. Um, Medicaid, the applications which are used to um, cover a person's stay at a nursing home, the workers are all working from home for the most part. So there's a, a slowness there trying to get um, information from them to process those applications. And in general, there's just a lot of um, questions people have. Well, how am I going to get my CARES Act monies, the stimulus money? How does that money affect uh, my other benefits? Uh, you know, folks who are on SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income, they only um, can keep $2,000 in the bank at any one time. And so when they get this 1200 bucks in the bank, how does that affect them? Well, there are special rules um, where they're able to, to keep that actually without it affecting the benefits. So what we've done is one of our programs is the Senior Legal Advice Helpline. And we've actually opened that up to the whole state. Usually it's the eight counties of Western New York and Monroe, Livingston, and Steuben. In light of the coronavirus and the pandemic and the need to get good information out there, um, we've opened this helpline up to everybody. And so anybody can call, um, an attorney will get back to them within a day and talk about their legal issue and see if it's something that they can, uh, we can help with, if we can point them to the right direction. 
if we can even straight up answer a question and you know what runs the gamut of well if i'm at a um essential worker do i have to come what does it have to do with um you know my rent evictions all these things that they, they all touch the law they're all related to executive orders and everything else and so we've been updating our blog at elderjusticeny.org with all kinds of good information um answers to questions and uh trying to point people in the right direction so they have a good source of information now do you find that people who do contact you have good results if we can resolve it on the call and answer their question beautiful that's that's the best thing i want a caller to be able to hang up afterwards and say i got my question answered and i now understand what's happening if we're not able to answer the question right on the call we can actually refer the case over to one of our units at the agency so we have um attorney paralegal teams who we can refer those cases to and they can give that call or call back and see if they're able to um uh resolve it if not you know we're a not for profit law office so we don't handle all types of cases so if it's something we can't help with we try to refer to uh the bar association to see if they can set them up with an attorney or another not for profit legal services organization but we, we don't leave people high and dry and always try to give them good information so they can get pointed in the right direction it sounds like an invaluable resource for the elderly population here in in the region but it also seems like you offer uh, a good resource to people who just care about those um, who are most vulnerable. It's, it's certainly worthwhile work, and it's definitely necessary. Do you ever, just judging by what we had talked about earlier about future shock, do you yourself feel a bit of future shock or just shock in general at the change with regard to the stimulus monies and all these other provisions that might change the legal status of an individual? It, it's just amazing how fast we've all had to, to catch up. You know, for for our work, most attorneys, if they're practicing and, and going into court, you go into court, you see the judge, you, you file documents at the courthouse. All of that came to a screeching halt. And so to think that it's almost been about two months since all this started now. And, you know, I haven't set foot in a courtroom in two months. And now they've come up with ways to do it via Skype for business. or you're doing telephone conferences. I believe the, um, the court system set up a new filing system where you can file documents online and they put the whole thing together in like 72 hours. It, it, it's incredible how fast we've had to move and change and still be able to, to find a way to help the clients. And that's ultimately the, the most important thing. And every once in a while, I just have these moments where you sit back and you're like, oh yeah, I, I used to drive my car into work every day. And I used to uh, uh, walk up to my office and work at my desk. And now it's this all strange blur, but that doesn't change the fact that we're still doing that same work to help the people. Do you feel like these recent developments have exposed any glut or any inefficiencies in the way the legal system operates or just, I mean, what is your own beat on this? Do you think that any sort of deficiencies have been exposed? And you can answer as openly or as narrowly as you want. I think it's interesting to see how it's changed everything now and how that's going to make an impact in the future. I mean, we're only two months into this. The ripple effects are going to be for a long, long time. Is a lot of times local nursing homes or council who are in another part of the state. And in the past, they would you know fly an attorney from New York City to uh, uh, Buffalo to appear. Now that we've gotten used to this appearing via Skype for business, I doubt that's going to be something that happens for the long term. This electronic filing thing, it's going to be becoming more mandatory going forward. I think once that genie is out of the bottle, it uh, changes a lot. I, should, I don't think it's all going to go back to how it was prior to March 12th. I think we'll sort of see a, a blend of the new and the old. Now, do you like that or are you resistant to it? Or are you agnostic about it? You have to see what happens in order to maybe make a, a determination. I think that for a person to be able to be seen in the eye by a judge is an important thing so that they have a chance to, to see another person in the flesh, to confront their the, the jury if they're uh, in a criminal or a civil trial. If there's a jury, that the jury can lay eyes on this person for in real life. You know, I... I 
I can't be brought kicking and dragging into the future because I know we have to. If you don't move forward and you don't adapt new methods, then and then you're you stand around realizing everybody's moved ahead without you. I also think it's important that we can't lose touch of the things that are old fashioned that are important. Spending time with with a client, spending time with a person, whether it's in a work setting or a life setting, the little things in life that may seem trivial or that some people may assume are just small talk, having a connection with another human being day to day is an important thing to me, and I think it's tough. Um, one of the things I'm struggling with really is is not having that, and this is just a, a side story, but. My wife wanted a delicious burrito from a restaurant a couple weeks ago. Delicious so I go in. Delicious burritos are always the best. They are, you know. They're stuffed with so many things, and then when you make it at home, it's never quite the same, you know. Mm-hmm. So I'm there waiting in the the restaurant and waiting for the order to be ready for me to pick up. And I'm standing in this area, and everybody's got a mask on, and you can't even see people's faces, and you can't talk to each other. And there's just this tension in the air, like people are on edge. And so I said, I'm going to get the heck out of the restaurant. And I waited outside because it was taking a while. And then there was a guy sitting in the passenger seat of his car. I think his wife was inside getting the food. I signaled for him to roll down his window. And I said, hey, buddy, what time was your taco order for? So I could see, you know, where I might be if he was still waiting, vice versa. And then I struck up a conversation with him and he told me about his life and that he was a cancer survivor and the work he does for a local uh, auto dealership. And just talking to another person and interacting with them really changed my mood from being depressed in the restaurant to actually then talking to somebody. And, you know, I'm an extroverted person. And so being able to be with people is an important thing to me. And I had, you know, I realized how much I miss it when I actually have those moments with people. Well, not to diminish what happened, but for somebody to reveal such intimate details to a stranger on a sidewalk, to me, it's that kind of speaks to a a sort of starvation, a social starvation that that man must have been engaging in, you know, to release such intimate medical details about himself. Mm -hmm. So I think you're on to something. Do you suppose that things are going to change for the better? And what I mean specifically is... Do you think that as a society, we are going to maybe value ourselves a bit more? That prior to this, I think people were very keen to kill time or to be distracted in ways that were not, in my own opinion, valuable. Just always checking an Instagram or a social media feed just to make your mind someplace else. Now that we have so much downtime, we realize we would rather be doing things. Mm -hmm. Do you think that any of that changes or do you think that I've got it wrong? Maybe my approximation is incorrect from the outset. I think what's tough is the balance of recognizing that we're human beings who have a capacity to do so much. And, you know, I struggle with being able to just relax sometimes. So where's the line between actually making a difference and doing things that are important versus just screwing around and Is it okay to sometimes just screw around for the sake of screwing around? I do think though, your bigger point about what are we doing with our time? The the, the whole idea that, you know, time is fleeting, that our lifetimes can be short, that, you know, people who are seemingly healthy can, you know, get this disease and and be gone. Um, Being able to connect with folks and, and appreciate that time. I mean, I've been saying, I would love to just go to a bar and hear that din of, of a, a bar with somebody shouting in order for a drink and music in the background and the sound of people talking on a street. All these sounds that just populate our everyday lives, um, I, I'm going to cherish that more. And this whole pandemic is going to have a, a scar and impact that the fallout trauma of it will be felt for years and years and years. And I don't think that we know exactly how that will be. Uh, my wife made a good point a few weeks ago. What what scares me is, you know, we can get into a whole discussion about right or wrong relative to the response to, to the attacks of 9-11. But there was, no, there was no going back to normal after that. To this day, I have to walk through a metal detector to go to a Sabres game or a Bisons game. There's no more getting across the border by just saying citizenship U.S. 
that all changed nearly 20 years ago and it, that hasn't changed back. We still have to take off our shoes in the airport and you can't bring a bottle of water on. That never went back. So how do we get back to being able to give a hug to a friend and be able to live in community with one another and have those shared communal experiences? I mean, going to a concert or a show or going to you know any shared gathering, sporting event, whatever it is, those are important human connections. Uh, you know, obviously we have to somehow get back to that, but it's going to be a painful yearning, I think, for many people to, to wanting to get back to that. And it may well take longer than we want it to. It's interesting you should say that because I personally think that any major change cannot be fully appreciated until you've underwent it. Whether that's the death of somebody you didn't think could die or a tragedy you didn't think could happen. So the idea of there never being large public gatherings for fear of biological calamity, for lack of a better phrase, is it's certainly possible. I think that we have to consider that things are going to be different or we have to maybe suffer more than we're willing to. I think that the coronavirus and the response is a painful experience and I think that it's not without its benefit. I think that we have to truly appreciate some of the pain if we're to come out of it any better and I think that some people don't want to feel any of the pain of it. I hear people talk in very dismissive ways that when we get back to normal and I, my, the skeptical part of my brain says there's, it's not going to return back to normal at the, or at the very least it's not going to return back to what we thought it was because it's impossible. Once something has happened, once a stone's been cast into a pond, those ripples, they ripple out. And even though it has the illusion of being still, it's it's certainly different, right? So what are some of your predictions for what's going to happen? And then what are some of your predictions for what you would like to happen in mm -hmm. response to all of this? Well, I, when you, what you just said, and I want to highlight your comment about going through this and unfortunately you know nobody we spend so much time running from well i don't want to be sad mm -hmm. and trust me depression is serious mental health is serious it's certainly necessary to go and resolve those things and, and talk about them and, and live with them what well, but they're um, adept uh, excuse me they're they're adaptive features too there's a reason they feel a certain way because it's meant to, or this is, this is my point of view, it, you're supposed to learn something from it. You're supposed to get some sort of cognitive reasoning from it so that maybe you could become more resilient in the future, or pass that on to subsequent generations so they're able to, to, to traverse it. You're not supposed to entirely avoid pain because... No, you do so. no and, and not that you're saying that. I'm just... I meant no, I'm, I'm, I want to agree with you. The, the, the fact that human beings suffer and we, we go through heartbreak and tragedy and live through brokenness, you can't, you can't understand what joy is if you don't go through that. And it sucks when, when you're hurt and when you're broken and when you feel like crap. But those things are, are necessary. It's part of the human condition. It's a, it's a lucky thing to feel sadness in a way because you're fully alive in that way and you can be touched in that way. And of course that doesn't feel good in the moment, but you don't want to sit there crying about uh, um, some sort of heartbreak or tragedy and say, this is great. I'm so happy, but we need to, we need to experience that. So how does that, what do I think will happen as a result of this? I think that the, the way we interact with friends and family members is, you know, we're going to cherish that time more than ever, I think. Um, I think that's going to be something that's felt for uh, uh, the next few years. I also think that the, the generation right now, the, the kids who are graduating high school and college, um, this is going to have a profound impact on them to, to not to lose your, your, you know, senior year of high school is so important. It's formative. We can, we can laugh and joke about high school kids, but this is the most important thing to them. And to, to lose all those, those things is tough. 
um, you know, tradition, it's, it's easy to, um, you know, do we fall into tradition just for tradition's sake? But I think that certain issues of ceremony and tradition have provide meaning to the way we do things. I'm an and, anthropologist after a fashion. I agree with that. I don't think that there's enough ceremony and pageantry, especially in uh, secular American life. I say this as an atheist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there, no, we don't have these coming of age ceremonies for people. And I think that that's why um, binge drinking becomes almost like a, a demarcation of adulthood mm -hmm. in in college age kids. That they're yeah having having these things that are 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 our, our guideposts in a way or that that bring us collectively that we all have this experience when you don't have that it, it's tough um i think what's also interesting about um a, a point you made probably uh maybe about 10 minutes ago was you and i are both in our 30s and we're looking at i remember being in history class in high school and middle school and thinking about history as though it's all in the past. Look where we are now. You know, wow, there was a pandemic in in the uh, uh, in the 1918 or the the world wars. These sorts of things. Yes, I know that there was conflict in the Middle East. Yes, those things have you know it always felt over there. For folks of our generation, between you know terrorist attack on 9/11, the housing crisis of of 2008, you have. Um, you know, the rise of, of uh, uh, all kinds of extremist groups. Now this pandemic and the subsequent economic collapse, I mean, this is uh, uh, a really, really difficult time for, for young adults. And how does that shape how they move forward? How does that shape the way they view the world? I think it's going to it's going to be different than it would have been otherwise. Well, I want you to I want you to explain the full breadth of of what you think is going to happen but i do want to ask hasn't this always been the case even if we think we're we're removed from history or from reality reality has a very um unbeaten track record of reminding people that it's real so that is that is a great quote so i think you're absolutely right i think can't that... hide from reality it's going to catch no. you mm-hmm yeah, I think you're right. And that's partially my own biases of, well, we think we've got it all figured out and but, we don't, you know. But to your point, I think I think um I full disclosure, I I don't want to talk politics so much, but I mean this in an ancillary way. When Barack Obama talks about being on the right side of history, that always struck me as sort of um presumptuous because um we're not in a post historical era. And um, hist I'm a fatalist after a fashion, too, that nothing happens unless it happens. So, um, and again, to knock on the door of politics, when people were telling me in July of 2016 that Donald Trump wouldn't be the president, I kept saying, unless he does become the president, you just, this assuredness and this idea that certain things are un. Uh, unable or were they they simply cannot happen or that things will continue as they are it just seems so presumptuous and like it philosophically wrong and not just philosophically wrong i mean it's demonstrably false everything it's going it cannot be true do you know folks think they have things figured out or well this is the right. way it has to be and it's it's that's the way it is until it's not and there's nothing that says oh yes uh we will always have fresh water available correct or we will uh, we'll always have uh, uh you know the the way that the toilet the, the, just, <laughs> exactly no i mean just things that you don't even think and that's what i was talking about with a large scale change is only viewable from the other side of it. You cannot mm -hmm. anticipate it until it happens. People are alive until they are dead, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, this idea that we are going to avoid a super bug in perpetuity mm -hmm. is laughable to me. Or my, One of my favorite theories that is not my own, but something that I uh, uh, think about often is the scale of time. And 
the the idea that the, the this country as a, a country I mean uh, uh, that's been in existence pursuant to a founding document 1776 it's nothing mm-hmm. and and we look at our, our our lives and people think the way it is now is the way it's always been or the way it was when they were a kid was the way it's always been when in reality our 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 lifetimes and then you look at the the time of uh, uh, the, the age of this country, it's so young, it's such a blip on the grand scale of history in the time of this planet's been around. Mm-hmm. To try to understand that is is difficult for me to, to wrap my head around. When you're talking about knowing history and thinking about it, it's not knowable until after the fact. A, a place like New York City, it's gigantic. Do you think that when they were first settling anybody had any conception that it was going to turn into what it is now you know or no and so you don't know what will be until you're there and even when you're there it does not mean uh that it continues on like that forever i agree wholeheartedly because you only have your portion of time to live really and mm-hmm. to to think that you would have lived the past better than those denizens of the past or that you would control the future better than those denizens of the future is folly. I think it's also almost an admission of moral defeat that you are better served to be in a different time period. It's an abdication, rather, of your responsibility to make the world what it should be in the present. Do you agree? or How do you reconcile what we think the world should be in the present with what the people who are having this conversation a hundred years from now will say about you and I. In that, right, there's always take an issue like um, women's suffrage. There were people who were in support of women's suffrage Mm -hmm. and there were people who were opposed. Now, the people who supported that, they were out on a limb advocating for something that other people didn't think was right. So when you go to this right side of history argument, right, we, the, whether or not we like that expression, I would be glad to know that my ancestors were on the side of, of women's suffrage and giving them the franchise to allow them to vote. I think I know what you're saying, but again, I just have to be skeptical of it because I can't say with any certainty how I would feel in a different situation. I'm a creature of my time, so for me to say that I would be a suffragist or a suffragette um, then, or that I would hope they would be that demonstrates a certain moral, um, not immediacy, but totality that I'm I'm uncomfortable ascribing no, I, to. No, that's the second point of my argument, oh. which is, is, okay, so if somebody was, if somebody's looking at us a hundred years from now and oh, saying we're beasts, that- we're barbarians compared to exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah. What I'm doing right now is, is terribly objectionable. It wouldn't be fair from the person from the future to say, oh, Brad and Sal should have known that it was wrong to use a computer because the mineral that's used to create it was so finite and everything they did completely destroyed this society. Well, uh, I mean, um, you don't even have the, to the earth for doing it. Yeah, you don't even have to be that drastic. For instance, you can say, okay, let's assume in the future that we we go further down um, the left wing diet or, or whatever we want. Like, so that there is what they call a progressive stack where you and I are white males and we're less deserving of certain privileges that should be afforded to people who are considered more disenfranchised, right? So you can have that, or you can go in the opposite direction, a more right-wing totalitarian, like religious conservatism, that you and I are waxing poetic and freely talking about our belief or disbelief in something, and we strayed from maybe God's plan. So one way we we strayed away from what God had wanted, and then the other is that we weren't in line with the progress of the humanist endeavor. So I, I fully anticipate that we're beasts, that we are um, monsters in the future. But How do you then live your life and not get so in your head? I tell myself that I only have to live my portion of it. You know, like you've heard of the monarch butterfly, right? 
Yes, I've, yes. I've seen one before. <laughs> right. Okay. This is a butterfly that makes a global trip. And I think it takes in total two years for the trip to be complete from like the Yucatan to wherever it is they go. But here's the kicker. A monarch butterfly lives less than two years. Two generations make the trip. So you only have to live your leg of the journey. I don't have to suffer the insults of people from the past, and I don't have to suffer insults from the people of the future. Further, I don't have to try and win their praise either. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like that poem about Ozymandias, like here was Ozymandias, king of kings, and it's just a... It is a, a statue in the desert that's rubble. This person no longer mm -hmm. exists because they only lived their own leg of the journey. I see that look in your eye. You seem to, that's uh, maybe you you disagree. No, I don't. I don't think I disagree. I, I think it's discomforting way, even though I know it's true. You know, we go on. Um, you have archaeologists who, who have done excavations of the Great Pyramids of Egypt and, oh, here's King Tut's tomb and all that. That that was, you know, in that time, that was somebody who was a, a, a god, somebody who was a, a leader. And then it's like, oh, we're, we're looking at them in this way. It's just weird to think, you know, 300 years from now, oh, look, we excavated the body of JFK. Check it out. He was a president. You know what I mean? It's It's... You're right that all this is that all this is fleeting. It's it's dust in a way, and that's why all I can do is be in control of the way that I am now, and the way I treat you, and the way I treat others. And you know, in general, I know we've been on a, on a heavy segment here of, of the show, but in general, I try to get a kick out of life. There are times when I get down, and my wife can attest to that. But in general, I try to feel lucky to be alive, that I can breathe the air and look at nature and, and spend time with people who I love, yourself included, and, and be able to do that. And so if I'm able to do that, then, then I feel good. So I guess I'm confused. Do you feel empowered by the notion that your time is fleeting or do you feel disenfranchised by the notion that your time is fleeting? I usually feel... Um, I don't know if what was what was the word you used, Sal? The Just, first one. Um, empowered. I suppose I feel empowered because nothing in life is granted. Is what I try to remember. Now, we could talk about how that maybe fuels some of my anxieties and and nervousness, but I think more of the time I try to understand that. I don't want to fill my time being upset about things that I can't control or being anxious about things that are beyond my ability to influence in some ways. Cause I could walk out the door and get hit by a bus tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a, today I was driving around and I saw a car speed through an intersection as an ambulance was coming. Yet luckily the ambulance had stopped before it came through. So nobody got hurt. But for our listeners, I mean, that's supposed to be the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's 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 dangerous, you know, when what we do in our everyday lives. The fact that we get into a car every day and drive around is really kind of insane when you think about it. But we do it every day and we're used to it. So for me, I try to, to live life in a joyful way, but maybe... Maybe that's my own. Maybe that's not true. I, I don't know. We're, we're really, we're really prying here. This is tough. Well, I mean, I don't think that there's any, um, there's any downside to trying to enjoy your your time here. And I don't know that I have any better answer other than you know we're all gonna pass out of time at some point. Mm -hmm. Whether we were human mm -hmm. beings, whether we were deer or beavers or dinosaurs or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's gonna happen. Like the Reapers coming for you, one way or the other. Right. So, God, if this is this is morbid, and people don't like when I say this, but yeah, you, if you imagine that your whole lifetime is one hour on the face of a clock, I'm 32 years old. So what? I'm like 20 past, probably. You know, I'm, it's it's your time goes quickly, and so trying to 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 take advantage of every breath that you have is 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 an awesome responsibility in a way. Um, but it's something that I want to, you know, do better and, and try to sh try to 
spend less time being uh, mixed up or anxious about those sorts of things. So to bring this into totality, do you feel that people will? Do you think that they'll get a significantly greater appreciation of time, or do you think that it might exacerbate our, our perverse want to dispose of time? Because I know I think that it's... a lot of people are spending the this lockdown, or whatever you want to call it, gazing into their phones. And I think that that's abysmal. I think I have to hope it's the former. Because if we look at, again, the, the, the history of the human humankind and the human spirit over the, the eons, you think about how much horror and trauma and death and destruction that so many people have seen. And yet they continue to live on and have children and push forward. And I think that's that drive is always going to be there. I mean, you look at folks after World War II when, you know, you saw some of the worst horrors and in the world and they said, you know what, we're going to have everybody come back and go to college and we're going to do a GI Bill and we're going to do these things. I mean, it would be very easy to say, oh yeah, uh, how many thousands of people just died? Um, we've dropped atomic bombs and seen unforeseen horrors and... You know, we, everybody just didn't become a nihilist and throw their hands up. We we, we push forward. It's but interesting think, you say think that yeah. because there's weddings and there are still children born in Idlib in Syria. And mm -hmm. um, spiritualism became in vogue after the First World War because people saw the, the ironic inhumanity of humanity mm -hmm. that people could be led to their deaths for no certain reason, fed into a, ostensibly a meat grinder, entire villages hollowed out of their young men, and uh, mm -hmm. and life kept on going. It's the only thing. And you know what? Even if this virus kills everybody, you know, there's raccoons. Raccoons will be <laughs> waiting in the, uh, in the wings. So for that's your version of uh, uh, Bear uh, City? No, what's his name in uh, uh, Jurassic Park? Ian? Oh. Um, uh, Life yeah. will find a way, except for, instead of dinosaurs for you, it's the raccoons. Well, but it's true. And every every Earth Day, I post this quote that the Earth is not in jeopardy. We're in jeopardy. We don't have the power to destroy the planet or to mm -hmm. save it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's true because you had mentioned even just the length of time our country's been around is a fraction of what older countries have been like in right. in Europe and in Asia, right? And mm -hmm. even our species is at most maybe two and a half to three million years old. And that's a pittance mm -hmm. compared to something like a shark. And right. even then, a shark is 300 million years old. And mm -hmm. life came, our planet evolved. Uh, our planet's been around for like 4.8 billion. And the universe is, we, as far as we can say, is 13 billion. There's nothing special about us in terms of the time we occupy. We might be special in our own ways and we might be special to each other and that I'm not discounting that, but mm -hmm. it's part of what we do for ourselves. If we we're our own salvation, really. That's mm -hmm. that's the best I can I can figure. So we got to be good to each other and we've got to try and do better. I agree. So now that we've gotten some of the <laughs> darker thoughts out of our minds, I wonder if you might tell me a little bit about your time as a community theater member, because for people who don't know, you're also a member of the East Aurora Players, correct? Absolutely, yes. I, uh, I started doing uh, theater back when I was in middle school. I uh, was in a production of... The Wizard of Oz when I was in seventh grade or sixth grade. I played the Emerald City Guard. It was great. And then in seventh grade, I was in Cinderella and I was the king. Also, it was great. Um, did it all through high school. A lot of fun. I just, there was something about that, of about being something greater than yourself and going through this process of auditioning and rehearsals for three months and you put on a show. It's incredible. Um, sort of lost touch with that in college. I did the, the UB choir chorus for a couple semesters um and then after i was done with grad school and everything i uh auditioned for a production of greece at aurora players in east aurora um just to do something for fun and meet some new people and uh so i met my wife she was the choreographer and right. i was cast 
you. If Jean, I can just stop you real quick, you mean your current wife, right? Yes, my yeah. What other <laughs> wife could there be? Oh no, I'm just. I wanted to get you on record. I yes, my say, current wife. Okay. We uh, you know, there's something about just the 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 friendships you form doing theater. The neatest thing about it to me is you don't know these people a lot of times when you're when you have your first read through of the script, and within two and a half months, it's like they're you've been with these people for a lifetime and they all, you have all these jokes and you feel that closeness and the connection that it takes to rely on all, each other to put on a show. And, you know, some I've come to the realization that some of those friendships become lifetime friendships. Mm -hmm. Some of them are just for the duration of the show. And that's, that's okay. Those people were in your life for that moment. And it's, uh, you know, there's a great theater scene in Buffalo. Obviously it's tough right now with the Corona, but, um, there's so many good people out there doing so much, uh, Good work, both fun and light, and also, you know, serious and impactful. Now, a um, couple of things. What was it that initially drew you to theater? Did you see a production, or did you always, like, are you from a theater family? Not really. It's funny that I, I, uh, I, isn't it funny that I can't even think about why I would have, um, what drew me to audition in, in sixth grade? Well, you I did married into a theater um, family of sorts, right? Oh, that's absolutely true. My wife has been very involved in theater for her whole life. She actually worked for a a, a theater company in New York City, um, Signature Theater, for uh, several months, which was incredible for her. And there's just, um, I don't know, I've just always gotten a, a kick out of it. I've really, really loved it. I, there's just something about uh, putting a show on and, and being on stage and the thrill and rush of it is just awesome. You like making people laugh, so do you? Do you tend to go towards like the the lighter fare, the comedy stuff? I do I? I've never. I enjoy seeing some serious drama. We've seen, you know, my wife and I have I've seen productions of the Diary of Anne Frank and uh, many uh, very intense plays. Mm -hmm. um, but for whatever reason, I don't find myself drawn to act in those. Maybe it's just the fact that my job is. Uh, you know, I deal with heavy stuff all the time um, that I'm not usually um, interested in doing plays that are a little bit heavier, but not like out of the question that I would ever do it. Yeah. So there's a degree of escapism, maybe a bit of exhibitionism. Maybe you get to put on the mask of somebody that uh, I'm you're for full disclosure. You're a pretty jovial, convivial person. I but but your work yeah. obviously has some stark realities to it. But maybe it allows you to um, to uh, code switch uh, to a certain extent. Um, now, if this lockdown wasn't happening, do you suppose that you would be engaging in a production right now? I, you know, I go back and forth. I do love doing it. The the tough thing about this this hobby is that it takes a lot. You know, you, you work a full work day and then you go to rehearsal for two and a half hours sometimes and you come home and go to sleep and do it all over again. So I toy back and forth. It's been about a year since I've been in a show. Um, we did a production of The Secret Garden out in Alden. Um, yeah, I saw it. You're which great. was a beautiful... Yeah, thank you. Um, but I, um, you know, I, I, I go back and forth. Usually it takes a show that I'd be really excited about doing for me to... Uh, want to audition it's not something where I, I constantly need to scratch that itch but I, I do when I do it I love it and then when I'm away from it I'm okay with it but I'm sure at some point I'm going to want to audition again soon do you miss the camaraderie the subculture oh yeah I mean that's that's half the fun is going out for drinks and food after the show um you know as you 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 just form these bonds with people and, and that's just a, a wonderful thing yeah, it seems that way. I've uh, I've gone to one of those after, um, what would you call that? After, uh, just after like you party, go out like after a rap party. Or something. Yeah. yeah, and it seems very close knit, and it's it's not a culture that I have any real um, uh, familiarity with. But it seems nice, and it seems supportive, and it seems like there's war stories to be um, shared yes. between people. Um, so. No, it, it's the telling of the stories, and it's also, we, at the beginning of the program, we talked about the uh, older generations and younger generations. What's neat about a lot of shows is, you know, I'm comfortable talking with somebody who's uh, 10 years my junior, 
And then I have people who are in their 50s and 60s, and you're all just together having a great time. It's really a, a neat thing about uh, the theater community is being able to interact with these people who are run their gamut from, you know, being in their 20s to being in their 60s. It's it's a neat, uh, one of the neater aspects about uh, being part of that community. Yeah, it's an equalizer in terms of um, your dedication is what makes you inaugurated, huh? Yeah, when you're when you're in that, um, and you show up and you show that you're committed, it 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 shows that you're part of the group, you're part of the team. Okay, well, I appreciate you taking the time with me, Brad. I'm gonna try and take this thing in for a landing. Um, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on the Twitter machine. My handle is at B Lolliger. Easy to find. It's usually stuff about logos and game shows. <laughs> Occasionally something political. You know, nothing too crazy. But that's that's where you can find me. But it's a pretty entertaining feed. Maybe uh, if people have any interest in AAA um, baseball or AHL hockey, they can uh, tune in. Mascots. Here. Lots of mascot content. Lots of... Uh, 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 things of that nature, yes. <laughs> and Sal, I want to thank you for, for inviting me on the program. You're uh, uh, a great interviewer, and we had a great time, uh, you know, delving deep and talking all about me and you, and I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, and I just have to say, um, I part of the reason I wanted to do this was because I was doing the, um, the drawing videos anyway, and because we're in a stay-at-home order. Um, it, it was a good opportunity to just kind of talk with my friends uh, and talk to them about what it is they do, their passions and uh, the specifics of their their working lives and just share that. And, you know, even if nobody listens, I, I have a record of having had these great conversations with people. And to me, that's that's valuable. So um, thanks again, Brad. It's been really wonderful. And uh, I'm I'm sure that uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Sal. And that was my conversation with Brad Lolliger. You can find him online at elderjusticeny.org or on Twitter at blolliger. You can find me online at salchandra.com or on Instagram at salcomics. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon for updates on new videos and content. Thank you for joining me for my Saturday night special, and please tune in next Saturday at 9pm for a brand new conversation in Slate of Drawings. Until then, take care of yourself.